This is a recording of chapter eight, Sustaining Biodiversity, the Species Approach. So first we'll discuss threatened and endangered species. Endangered species are species that have so few individual survivors that the species could soon become extinct overall or most of its natural range. So some examples are the Mexican gray wolf. There are 42 of them in forests of New Mexico and Arizona. The Sumatran tiger, there are less than 60. The California condor, there are 187. And the whooping crane, there are 407 in North America. A threatened species is a vulnerable species and threatened species still have enough remaining individuals to survive in the short term, but because of declining numbers, they're likely to become endangered in the near future. So there are certain characteristics that can put species in greater danger of extinction. And those include having a low reproductive rate. So they don't have a lot of babies and the gestation period might be long. Having a specialized niche, having a narrow distribution, being at the top of the food chain, which here it says feeds at high trophic level, that means the top of the food chain. Having specific migration patterns, being a rare organism, being commercially valuable, and having larger territories. And these are some examples of different animals and plants that are in danger of extinction or that have the certain characteristics that make an organism be in danger of extinction. And this shows percentages of various species that are threatened with extinction due to human activities specifically. So plants, 70% of plants, 34% of different fish species, 37% specifically are freshwater, Amphibians, 30%, reptiles, 28 mammals, 21 and birds, 12%. Why should we care if humans are speeding up the rate of extinctions? There are three major reasons why we should be preventing extinctions caused by human activities. The world species provide natural resources and natural services that help to keep us alive and support human economies. So for example, many plant species provide food crops, provide uh, fuel wood and lumber. Lumber is when you use wood to build. Also paper and medicine. And preserving species also provides economic benefits because of ecotourism and wildlife. Like people go on safaris or they'll go somewhere to look at the animals in a tropical rainforest, let's say. The second major reason is that it could take five to 10 million years to restore the biodiversity just lost in this century. So it takes a short time to cause harm, but it takes millions of years potentially to have restoration. So that's another reason why we really should prevent the loss in the first place. 
And the third major reason is an ethical responsibility that we have to prevent species from becoming extinct. So how are humans accelerating the extinction of species? The main cause is loss of habitat. That is the single greatest threat to species. And then we have this acronym HIPPCO, which summarizes the most important causes of extinction from human activities. So again, the, the most important threat is the loss of habitat. So we have habitat destruction, degradation, and fragmentation. The second on the list is invasive and non-native species. And then after that is population growth and increasing use of resources, pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. So first we'll talk about the habitat degradation and destruction. So that includes deforestation within tropical areas, the destruction and degradation of coral reefs and wetlands, the replacement of grasslands, which have biodiversity, with farms and plantations where they're only growing one plant. Now we call that monoculture. So you have this vast grassland with lots of different animals and lots of different plants. And then you replace that with a farm where you're only growing one plant, you are greatly reducing the biodiversity on that piece of land. And then you only have one type of plant. And then you lose a lot of the animals because you took away a lot of the plants that a lot of those animals were feeding on. You lose a lot of the insects, you lose a lot of the organisms. So that is a big cause of a loss of biodiversity. And then the fourth is pollution of streams, lakes, and oceans. Then we have habitat fragmentation. That occurs when a large area of a habitat is divided into smaller isolated patches or what we can call habitat islands. The causes of habitat fragmentation include constructing roads, logging activity, which means you are cutting down trees to use the wood for different purposes, agriculture, and urban development. So all of these are causes of habitat fragmentation. Most national parks and other nature preserves are habitat islands. And after the habitat loss and degradation of habitats, the biggest cause of animal and plant extinctions is the deliberate or accidental introduction of harmful invasive species into ecosystems. Again, that is the second on this list here, the HIPCO acronym. The second on the list is the invasive non-native species. Most species introductions are beneficial to the US or to us rather, such as food crops, livestock, and trees that you could harvest. So a lot of the food crops that people grow on farms may not necessarily be native plants. And the livestock may have been brought from another country. So a lot of species that are brought to another location are beneficial to us. Problems arise, however, 
when these species that were introduced have no natural predators, no natural competitors, they don't have parasites or pathogens that may help control their population numbers in the new habitat. So then at that point, they're able to outcompete the native species. Okay, so this is really important. That is when the main problems come up, is when there's no natural predators or competitors or anything that really controls their population numbers. And then they are able to just have unchecked population growth. And many times they do outcompete the species that were already there. An estimated 7,100 species that have been introduced into the US have caused ecologic and economic harm. Now, many non-native species are introduced accidentally. So they may arrive from other continents as stowaways on aircrafts, ships, in wooden packing crates, on cars, or with tourists. And these are some examples of harmful invasive species. And the top row are deliberately introduced and the bottom row were accidentally introduced. So here's a plant, purple loose strife. Here's the African honeybee, which has been known as the killer bee. Water hyacinth, the Japanese beetle, the European wild boar. And then accidental, we have the sea lamprey, an Argentina fire ant, a brown tree snake, Formosan termite, and a zebra mussel. And I have this link about wild boar with more information, and we will get to that in a minute. Also, we talked about the spotted, the spotted lantern fly. So here is the details, the case study of the European wild boar in North Carolina. So in the year 1908, an English company established a private hunting preserve, which we also can call a game preserve. So they bring in animals that people come to the preserve and they go hunting for the animals, but the animals are brought in from elsewhere to set up this, this hunting preserve. This was done in Graham County, North Carolina. And one of the types of animals that they brought in were these European wild boars. And they started with 14 boars and they brought those in in 1912. The population of these boars got larger. So by the end, by the early 1920s, there were over a hundred of these boars. And then they eventually escaped into the wild and they became destructive of the ecosystem. Today, there are thousands of them. And they were imported from Europe. So how were they destructive? They kill both native and domestic animals. They eat and damage crops. They damage fences. They could pass on diseases to livestock. And the females can have about five piglets per year, which allows their population to keep expanding pretty quickly. In 1959, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park began an eradication program that has removed over 10,000 of them. But their population keeps growing because they have few natural predators. So their population goes unchecked and it keeps increasing.
And then we're going back briefly to the spotted lantern fly to discuss the issues with them. So they are native to Asia and they were first seen in the US in Pennsylvania in 2014. And they feed on the plant sap of many different plants using a piercing, sucking mouth part. They feed on over 70 different types of plants, many of which are economically important plants, including grapevines, maple trees, black walnut, and other important plants in New Jersey. And the plants get stressed and many times they end up dying. These flies also excrete a sugary substance called honeydew, and that can attract bees, wasps, and other insects. And the honeydew builds up on plants and whatever surfaces are underneath where the lantern fly was eating, such as patios and furniture and all that. And it promotes the growth of a sooty mold, which is a fungus, and that can affect plants. It also affects the lower plants in forests, which are called the understory of a forest. So it's not only that these flies are eating plants or sucking the sap out, it's also that their honeydew sugary substance that they excrete attracts other insects like bees and wasps and also can start this growth of this fungus or promote the growth. And there is a website where you could report any sightings of the spotted lantern fly to the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. So you, there's this link here and you report the location and the date and you report if it's an adult or the younger stages and they have photos to show you examples. And then here is the campaign, join the battle, beat the bug, stomp it out, stop the spotted lanternfly. And then, you know, the footprints showing on these bugs. So they want you to smush them, step on them. And in the sighting report, it also asks you what happened. Like it asks you if you killed it or not. So they're keeping track of the different locations of where these flies are found. Here is another case study, the kudzu vine. This was deliberately introduced. It's a plant and it grows rampant in the Southeast US and it is known as the vine that ate the South. So in the 1930s, this vine was imported from Japan and planted in the Southeastern US in an attempt to control soil erosion. But it grew rampantly and here is a photo of an abandoned house in Mississippi, and the house has pretty much been taken over by the kudzu vine. And then we have examples of aquatic species that were introduced. So the Great Lakes in North America have been invaded by more than 185 non-native species and they threaten native species and cause billions of dollars in damages. These include the sea lamprey. That was that long skinny organism that was attached to the trout in a picture in an earlier slide. And then the zebra mussel. Zebra mussels have displaced some species that were already living there in the Great Lakes. They have depleted the food supply for others and they clog pipes. They shut down water intake pipes for power plants and city water supplies. They jam rudders of ships 
and they grow in huge masses on boat hulls, piers, and other solid surfaces. So here are zebra mussels attached to a water current meter in Lake Michigan. And they don't really have natural predators in the Great Lakes. So they just go unchecked in their population growth. So this is a list of things we could do to control invasive species. Do not capture or buy wild plants and animals. Do not remove wild plants from their natural areas. Do not release wild pets back into nature. That's really important. Um, for example, in the Everglades in Florida, people have released boa constrictors and other reptiles into the Everglades. And then they go ahead and propagate and then they become a problem to a lot of the other organisms that live in the Everglades. And those were just basically pets that people released into the wild. Do not dump the contents of an aquarium into waterways, wetlands, or storm drains. When camping, use wood found near your campsite instead of bringing firewood from somewhere else. Do not dump unused bait into waterways. After dogs visit woods or the water, brush them before taking them home. After each use, clean your mountain bike, canoe, boat, motor, trailer, all fishing tackle, hiking boots, and other gear before heading home. So basically, you want to keep whatever organisms are located where you are, you want to keep them there instead of spreading them to a different location. So we're going to continue going over that acronym, the HIPCO acronym. We're going to discuss the rest of the reasons for extinction of species. So we have human population growth and increasing use of resources. And that could lead to habitat loss. And that results from mining and exploration for natural resources, logging, deforestation. A lot of deforestation is due to clearing the land so that you could use the land to farm and to have pastures. Pastures are areas of land where you let you let your livestock graze and that would be like goats or cattle. Now we're going to discuss the details of this later in the semester as well. We'll talk about human population growth and use of resources. Then we have pollution. Pesticides, fertilizers, factories, all of these release harmful chemicals into the environment. Projected climate change that could help drive a quarter to a half of all land animals and plants to extinction by the end of this century. And we will discuss projected climate change later in the semester. And overexploitation, including overfishing, poaching, illegal sales of exotic animals as pets. The overfishing we will discuss in a later chapter in the semester. And then the rest we'll talk about today. So let's focus on the pollution first. For example, pesticides. So each year, pesticides directly kill about 20% of honeybee colonies, more than 67 million birds, and 6 to 14 million fish. Pesticides such as DDT accumulated in fatty tissues of organisms. That should say accumulate, so I just fixed it. So the pesticides accumulate in the fat of different animals. 
And then it leads to what we call biomagnification. The DDT can be biomagnified about 10 million times in a food chain of an estuary. Again, an estuary is an area where a river meets the ocean. And this biomagnification causes larger predatory animals such as an osprey, a brown pelican and bald eagles to die. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Also mercury in a tuna is biomagnified as well. So let's go over what biomagnification is. So bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So here at the base of the food chain, you have zooplankton. Now you have DDT in the water at only three parts per trillion or 0 0.000003 parts per million. So there's tiny, tiny amounts of DDT in the water in this diagram. So it's really tiny amounts of DDT. But then you have the plankton are, let's say, accumulating 0 0.04 parts per million of DDT in their bodies. And that comes from the zooplankton eating phytoplankton. So phytoplankton, all the way on the left here, it says phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are like the plant, they're like the, the plant-like plankton. And then the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. So you start out with the phytoplankton, although it's not shown in the diagram, the phytoplankton are going to accumulate a little bit of the DDT in their bodies. Then the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. And then these small fish, for example, minnows, the minnows eat the zooplankton, but you're gonna eat a few of them if you're a minnow, you're not just eating one. So you eat a whole bunch of these plankton. So then they're accumulating in their bodies 0.5 ppm, which is parts per million of DDT pesticides. So as you go up the food chain, each animal has more DDT per animal because you're eating a lot of whatever is lower on the food chain, right? So minnows eat thousands of zooplankton. And then you have these larger fish, in this case, these are needlefish, and they're eating about here, it says larger fish that eat 10 smaller fish. So this fish is gonna eat 10 minnows, for example. So then they will have two parts per million of DDT in their bodies because they ate minnows. Each minnow only had 0.5. So you're, you're magnifying through the food chain the amount of DDT in the bodies of each organism. So then these large predatory birds are going to catch these fish and they're going to eat a lot of fish. And then ultimately, like this is an osprey, eventually the fish will have 25 parts per million DDT, which is actually a lot. So the large predatory birds can actually die from the DDT poisoning. So that is biomagnification and the bioaccumulation is the fatty material in each organism is holding on to the DDT. 
So this is how a lot of large predatory animals, in, especially these birds, can die from the poisoning of the pesticides. You know, there was a book and a movie called Silent Spring. This was published in 1962, written by Rachel Carson. And she highlighted the environmental issues related to pesticide use. She was one of the first environmentalists. So chemical companies opposed to the book, but ultimately her writing led to the ban of DDT in the United States. So now we will focus on overexploitation. So illegally killing, capturing, and selling wild species threatens biodiversity. Some species are poached for their valuable parts or they are sold live to collectors. The global illegal trade in wildlife brings in an average of at least $600,000 an hour and at least 66% of all live animals that are smuggled around the world end up dying in transit. Organized crime has moved into the illegal wildlife smuggling because of the huge profits involved with it. Some examples include a mountain gorilla, which is a highly endangered animal, but a live mountain gorilla is worth $150,000 to smugglers. The pelt of a critically endangered giant panda can bring $100,000. A poached rhinoceros horn can be worth $25,000 per pound. But the rhinoceros is killed for their horn and then the rest of the body is not used for anything. So these are illegal trade, illegal smuggling, illegal poaching. In many parts of the world, th these practices are illegal. Also, more than 60 bird species, mostly parrots, are endangered or threatened because of the wild bird trade. And the pet trade is depleting populations of many amphibians, various reptiles, some mammals, and many tropical fishes. Some exotic plants are endangered when they are gathered for houseplants and landscaping. So this saguaro cactus can go for $15,000 or a rare orchid may go for $5,000 to collectors of plants. Also a rising demand for bush meat threatens some African species. So indigenous people in much of Western and Central Africa have hunted wildlife for bushmeat in sustainable ways for centuries. Now bushmeat means that you're killing wildlife as a food source, but they have done it sustainably for centuries. But in the, the last two decades, bushmeat hunting in some areas has skyrocketed as hunters try to provide food for rapidly growing populations or to make a living by supplying restaurants with exotic meat. So the bushmeat hunting has led to the local extinction of many wild animals. For example, one species of Colobus monkey went completely extinct. And this bushmeat hunting has been a factor in reducing some populations of orangutans, chimpanzees, elephants, and hippopotamuses. And in some parts of Africa, it is now not allowed for restaurants to serve certain exotic meat. 
So what are some solutions? We could protect biodiversity by protecting species, by looking at specific species and trying to protect them. International treaties and national laws can help protect species. So the 1975 Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, and these are the initials, this was signed by 174 countries and it bans the hunting, capturing, and selling of threatened or endangered species. And then we have the U.S. Endangered Species Act of 1973, and then it was amended in 1982, 1985, and 1988. It was designed to identify and protect endangered species in the United States and abroad. The National Marine Fisheries Service is responsible for identifying and listing endangered and threatened ocean species, while the US Fish and Wildlife Service identifies and lists all other endangered and threatened species. Any decision to add or remove a species on the list must be based on biological factors alone. So you can't bring in economic or political factors you have to use just the biological factors in order to make decisions for adding or removing species from the endangered or threatened list. The act also forbids federal agencies to carry out, fund, or authorize projects that would jeopardize an endangered or threatened species or destroy or modify their critical habitat, except for the Defense Department. Okay, so that is an exception to this. We can also establish wildlife refuges and other protected areas. So in 1903, President Teddy Roosevelt established the first US federal wildlife refuge at Pelican Island in Florida. And it was to help protect birds such as the brown pelican from extinction. The National Wildlife Refuge System grew to 553 refuges by 2011. More than three fourths of them serve as wetland sanctuaries vital for protecting migratory waterfowl. Then we have gene banks, botanical gardens, wildlife farms, and zoos. And these can all help protect species as well. So gene or seed banks preserve genetic information and endang endangered plant species by storing their seeds in refrigerated low humidity environments. More than 100 seed banks worldwide collectively hold about 3 million samples. And these are two photos from the seed bank. And let's look into more details on this. So this is inside the USDA seed bank in Northern Colorado. I guess if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we need to be ready for anything. No kidding. Not that you needed to tell that to the folks at CSU. As Denver said. I guess if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we need to be ready for anything. No kidding. Not that you needed to tell that to the folks at CSU. As Denver 7's Jason Grenauer reports tonight, they have spent the last half century preparing for the worst case scenario. This is the National Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation. A long name on an unassuming building on the CSU campus. But it's essentially the seed bank for U.S. agriculture and the world. Housing a fortune 
of a different kind of currency. I can confidently say that this building holds the largest seed collection in the world. Over a million samples in a zero degree freezer. These are seeds that are mainly used by humans. So they're the, the foods we eat, they're cotton, what we wear for uh, clothing. To keep them safe. Preserve the genetic diversity that is necessary for agriculture. Just in case. Well, agriculture is always facing some kind of a plague or some kind of a problem. Hence the liquid nitrogen. Right now this tank is about uh, minus 188 degrees. For certain seed samples. The oldest seeds that I know of are cotton from the 1930s. And it's not just deposited in and left to sit. These samples are constantly checked and monitored. We want what's going in to be very healthy and we want them to stay healthy. The National Reserve of sorts for seeds, making this Colorado's own Fort Knox. Something that I think we're really very proud of, that we're doing something that benefits everybody. In Fort Collins, I'm Jason Grenauer, Denver 7. And then we have the famous seed vault. This is a special place. Let's go deeper inside. We have prepared this seed vault for about 4.5 million seed samples. Welcome to the Global Seed Vault. This is a facility where we store copies of seeds from gene banks all over the world. So now we are entering a long tunnel which leads into the Global Seed Vault. Deep inside the Permafrost Mountain, close to the North Pole, is a storage facility with the capacity to store over 4 million different crops and a maximum of 2.5 billion seeds. The Global Seed Vault was created as a backup system for the world's gene banks to protect humanity against any catastrophes that could potentially wipe out our agricultural diversity. We are now quite deep in the mountain. When we pass this door, we are in the permafrost part of the rocks here. Now we are moving from approximately zero degrees into the permafrost section. We have the permafrost here, minus five. In there, it's minus 18. And here you can feel the atmosphere, it's silent, you can hear the echo. It's a very nice place to grasp the atmosphere of being in an important place. Some journalists call this the Noah's Ark of plant diversity. And personally, I think that's quite a good name. We call it the world's most important room. So let's go in. If the humanity can survive, we will need new plant varieties. And the material you need for developing new varieties are genetic diversity. We have seeds from all countries in the world. Kenya, Mexico, India, Peru, Germany, Colombia, Costa Rica, Zambia, Brazil, Australia. Here we have some nice wooden boxes from Tajikistan. Workers in gene banks, farmers have struggled to produce all these seeds and sent them here because they feel safe when they send the seeds here. Svalbard is a safe place. It's the permafrost here, so it's frozen even if the artificial cooling fails. And Svalbard is quite far away from conflicts. Here we have boxes from Russia, and here we are, have boxes from Ukraine. And even if there are enemies abroad, outside, in this uh, seed vault, they cooperate. And here is some wooden boxes made in North Korea. So even North Korea have sent seeds here, and in the seed vault here, international conflicts are cooled down. You see this empty space in this shelf. We had seed boxes from Icardas Gin Bank in Aleppo. They sent seeds here from 2008, and when the gin bank in Aleppo was ruined, we were able to send the seeds back so they can start creating a new gin bank. 
this system saved the seeds. If they had no backup here, the seeds would have gone extinct. This is the world's largest collection of genetic diversity of crops. What you see in here is 13,000 years of agricultural history. The genes you find in here existed in the natural flora in the Middle East 10, 15,000 years ago. And then farmers started to use these plants and they improved the plants into the crops that we have today. There is in the seed vault about 70,000 different varieties of barley and 150,000 samples of rice and 140,000 samples of wheat. Researchers they investigate what are the properties we find in these old uh, varieties, and they use the genes for making new varieties for new purposes, for new growing conditions. Without this material, plant breeders, agriculture will never manage to feed the growing population. This is the raw material that we need for the future, that breeders need to make new varieties to increase the world's food production. The work gene banks do every day, conserving their seeds, preparing the genes for future food supplies, is a very, very crucial and important work. I have quite good feeling when I'm in here and know that this is a resource that uh, the future will need. Seed goes extinct every day. And personally, it's a big motivation to think about all the work that has been done to bring the seeds here. And it feels very good to be a part of this global effort for future food supplies and conserve them in a safe place. Okay, and then there are 1,600 botanical gardens and arboreta worldwide. Arboreta is the plural of the word arboretum. And that's just a botanical garden, mainly with trees. And these botanical gardens and arboreta showcase almost one third of the world's known plant species and they have only about 3% of the world's rare and threatened plant species. So here's an example of an arboretum. It's called the Hoyt Arboretum. It's in Portland, Oregon. And here are some trees. And this one here is one of those large redwood trees that you find in California. And that's an example of a tree that was brought in from elsewhere and planted in this arboretum. It's almost like a museum for trees, right? They bring in trees from other places that live in other climates and so on. And they plant them around the arboretum. And then you could take walks and look at these trees that normally don't live in that spot, but you have an opportunity to see it. So it really is like a museum or like a zoo for trees. And this is just a little piece of the map and it shows you, so they have bristle cone pine trees on this whole trail. So you have to walk along the whole trail in this wooded area. And these are all the trees that have been brought in from other places and showcased. So here's white pine, ginkgo. And here's the spruce trail. Here's spruce, here's red pine, elm, oak. And there's a whole oak trail with different oaks. So this is just an example, but most of these trees are not native to this area. They were brought in here to be showcased in this arboretum. And along each trail is that type of tree. And then there, they have little signs next to some of the trees telling you what they are. So this is just an example. The map is a lot bigger, but this is just a piece of the map.
And then we have zoos and aquariums, which could also help protect some species. Also game parks, animal research centers. These are all being used to preserve some individuals of critically endangered animal species. And the goal, the long-term goal is to reintroduce species into protected wild habitats. Now, this is from the Natural Wolf Preserve in Columbia, New Jersey. And here's the website. So these are a couple of wolves. So they're living in a preserve and Again, the long-term goal is to reintroduce these species back into the wild, but it's protected wild habitats. And then finally, we have the precautionary principle. So when substantial preliminary evidence tells us that a particular activity may be causing harm, we should take the precautionary measures to prevent or reduce such harm, even if some of the cause and effect relationships have not been established scientifically. So this is really just a just in case situation. So just in case we are doing harm to certain animals, we should change what we are doing. Just in case, because we don't want to do harm to wildlife. Okay, so we take precautions just in case, even though we don't have all of the information on the cause and effect relationships between certain human activities and the harm being done to the animals. So we don't wanna wait for all the research to be done. That could take a long time. So this way it's like, we're taking precautions anyway. So that is the precautionary principle. And that brings us to the end of the discussion on chapter eight. Thank you for watching.